and welcome back to The Literary Lyricist, where we look at the art and craft of putting words to music. In the last episode, we looked at how the printing press helped to make the English language and English song lyrics endure relatively unchanged over centuries. The regularization and standardization of writing made speech and music more standardized as well. But English hasn't been trapped in amber. Culture and art are not about staying the same. They're about adapting and reacting to the world we're in. The things that have endured in English language songwriting are the things that give it the strength to endure. As I mentioned last time, the fact that well-crafted words and fine melodies endure is true, but it's a small point in the face of a much larger one. After more than a century of expansion, English music and English lyrics are not the globe-bestriding wall of bland oppression they once were. Now, there are a couple of dozen doctoral theses wrapped up in how English, or more accurately, American musical influence has spread across the globe, and how it's been appropriated by other cultures, in many cases supplanting what existed before. But today, at least, we'll leave that part of it alone. But what about people coming from other languages and cultures? What about when someone coming from another place arrives, likes what they're hearing, and says, yeah, okay. And more interesting to us, what happens to their words? This episode is part one of a two-part look at how that happens. Before we go any further, though, there's been a question dangling over these last two episodes, and that question is, what the f*** does a printing press have to do with music? Now, there's an easy answer to that, and a not-so-easy one. Let's take the easy one first. In the 19th century, printing technology had advanced sufficiently that sheet music could be mass-produced at prices that pretty much anyone could afford. It became so popular that newspaper baron William Randolph Hearst would print it in supplements to boost circulation. Last time I mentioned that this cultural tsunami whitewashed popular culture for decades and viewed from today's lens it was problematical, which I'm told is the polite way to say appalling. Look, there's, there's no sugarcoating it. Stephen Collins Foster was the most popular songwriter in America in the 1800s. He was also a guy who treated his indentured black servants who were slaves in all but name as property. And yet he entered the names of his indentured white servants into the family Bible. So maybe we shouldn't be too shocked to know that his blockbuster hit, Oh Susanna, was what they called Ethiopian music. And then, of course, there was this. It's hard to express how powerful and pernicious his influence was. He'd never lived in the South. He only visited the Southern States once on his honeymoon. And yet, he was the definitive voice of the African-American experience to the ruling classes of America in the 1800s and well into the 20th century. He wasn't the only one, of course. Some very prominent names were busy celebrating cultures not their own. These songs were still being taught to children when I was a kid. It never occurred to six-year-old me that the absurdly inverted logic in O oh Susanna was meant to denigrate the intellect of people who had been kidnapped, enslaved, and oppressed for centuries. I just enjoyed the nonsense. Yeah, well, not so funny now. It shames me to say it now, but we have to own these things. I used to sing Old Black Joe at the breakfast table. I loved the melody as a child. I even played it on the recorder. I thought it was so sad. So it's no accident that in my home, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy was shocking. 
but the assassination of Dr. King literally went unmentioned. And in the face of all this, the least I can do now is say how sorry I am. Someday I'll find a way to examine why these lyrics endure, why they seem so simple and charming, but not today. In their place, though, let me offer a few lines from a song derived from the actual experience of African American people in the 19th century. You can take my body, you can take my bones, you can take my blood, but not my soul. You can take my body, you can take my bones, you can take my blood, but not my Rhiannon Giddens is the co-founder of the Carolina Chocolate Drops and has done a great deal to reclaim the banjo as arising from the black experience of America and derived from African strings. So I've linked to the interview below. And thank God we have people like this for the next generation of children to learn from. Now, I only mentioned Stephen Foster because, well, first off, we can't deny the incredible power of popular music, even when it oppresses and extinguishes. And second, it helps us to understand how and why people who come to English from other lands, cultures, and languages are willing to abide it in order to appropriate that same power for their own ends. It wasn't always like this, by the way. There was a day when English was the minority language in the world of popular music. And it wasn't that long ago either. You don't believe me? Name an English opera. Go ahead. I'll wait. Oh, they exist. But for a very, very long time, they were considered kind of uh, down market. So much so that in 1728... A British composer named John Gay riffed on Jonathan Swift's idea of creating what he called a Newgate pastoral and tore a strip off Italian opera by dragging that genteel, refined tradition heels first through the mud and murder of London's slums. And the result was The Beggar's Opera, the story which starred robbers, whores, and scum of English society. The melodies were stolen from a book of traditional Scottish tunes, but the words were John Gay's. And over the course of three acts and 69 songs, Gay lays bare his pretty thinly veiled contempt for people who profit by stealing the wages of others and, like Mac the Knife, spend their time avoiding the consequences of their sordid criminality. These are quaint and meaningless concerns today, of course. Thank God that swamp's been drained. That thread was picked up in the 20th century by a group of young Germans who'd had their culture, their beliefs, and in fact their world annihilated by the First World War rootless and questioning the very foundations of morality, they found themselves adrift in a culture of official thievery and corruption in 1920s Berlin. Their translation of the story became the now famous Threepenny Opera with music by Kurt Weill and a book by Bertolt Brecht. <laughs> no, of course, it's not that simple. Brecht stole almost the entire thing from his lover at the time, Elizabeth Hauptmann. She was fascinated by the female characters in Gay's opera, and we all know this, of course, because that misdeed was long ago corrected, and today we all remember and celebrate the true author of the Threepenny Opera, Elizabeth Hauptmann. The opera's composer, Kurt Weill, 
was on a mission when he wrote the music for it. He didn't want to satirize opera. He wanted to put a knife to its throat and pull. The world at the time was contorted, amoral, and chaotic. And that is the world he put on the stage. He wanted to jar people out of their complacency and make them see for once the depravity of the world around them. His music wasn't going to flow sweetly, blending itself like sugar into a layer cake of story. He used his songs to bring the action to a shuddering halt. The actors would just stop in their tracks, turn to the audience, and belt away at them in broken voices, often accompanied by extremely weird instrumentation. This kind of approach was related to the Soviet tactic of agitation and propaganda, agitprop for short, as a way to get key messages out to the masses. It was blunt, unadorned, and in your face. The tactic was treated to a shallow lampoon by Mike Myers, Saturday Night Live character Dieter, who would stop in mid-sketch and declaim, Your story has become tiresome. Now's the time when Sprocket for me dies! <laughs> Now, during the 1930s, Brecht and Weil were exiled from Germany by the Nazis and they moved to New York. They lived there as relative unknowns for years. It would be decades before the Three Penny Opera finally found its way onto the American stage. The lyrics to its lead-off number went through countless changes over the years. Translated from German, they look a bit like this. I gotta confess, I find it hard to read that without falling into a Dieter voice. There's a reason for that, of course. The lyrics were meant to be harsh and confronting. We're talking about a killer here, someone who'll murder you for your paycheck. We're not supposed to like him. Now, Louis Armstrong was the first major American performer to popularize this song. The very first thing he did was swing the lyrics around a bit and smooth their edges. Armstrong spent his life trying to transcend the minstrel show. It's terribly tempting to behold that lampooning grin and the funny voice and think of him as a, a Uncle Tom with a trumpet, but that's only because the white English world only wants to remember him for what a wonderful world which, by the way, was his way of forgiving us. But look at this performance. Watch how he points the words, how he momentarily becomes the boogeyman he knows the whole white world is afraid of, and then shifts back into a shuffle-footed caricature before we even know he's gone there. I would argue that nobody understood that song better than Satchmo. Now, don't get me wrong, Bobby Darren was a decent guy who grew up poor and in later years became a stalwart civil rights activist. But when he echoed Louis' call-outs in the last verses of the song, he recognized Lotte Lenya, just as Armstrong had done, but he didn't add Louis. That was left up to Ella Fitzgerald in her Grammy Award-winning performance of it in Berlin. She forgot the words to the thing, but she didn't forget Satch. With every rendition, though, the lyrics have been smoothed out, the melody swung by its tail like a cat, and the character of Mac has become a parody of himself. In the end, he was worse than a joke. But never forget... Mac Heath was the child of revulsion against the way things were musically, culturally, and politically. He was the child of exiles and political refugees. 
He was the representation of a brand of vileness and amorality that abundantly deserves a reboot today. That's all we have time for in this episode of The Literary Lyricist. In the next episode, we'll take a detailed look at a, the most recent generation of songwriters who came to America to take back the power of music from it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>